Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to the 35th episode of the PEM Podcast, Psychic Guide Mystery Podcast. I'm your host, Victoria Laurie, with my fabulous co co fabulous co blah, 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 blah. easy for me to say, fabulous co-host, Sandy. Sandy, I almost said your last name. <laughs> Are you done? <laughs> no. Let's start no, again, not. shall we? There's more, there's more to unroll. Yeah. Hmm. Um, how you doing? How you doing, sister? How you doing? Uh, it's been a day. It's been a weekend. Painting and yeah. yep. boys yep. are around and one boy. Girlfriends are around. Yes. And no, I'm we very grateful. Love my nephew's girlfriend. We do. Like she's already part of the family. Basically. She is. Yeah. And she's breathtaking. Like yes. my my nephew, both of them are like. I know they're beautiful, but they really are. They're really, really handsome men. And um, he definitely, he went up. She's just dropped dead beautiful. Like, well, I've, taken. I've learned to probe her for information about both of my sons and what they've been up to. And I learned uh, yesterday that my other son, who's not dating the girlfriend, uh, pierced his ears over the weekend. Both of them? Yeah. yeah. So I get him on what? FaceTime, I get him on the phone, I'm chatting with him. I said, I said, so I hear you, you <laughs> pierced your ears. I could see a tattoo, but pierced ears, really? And That's he goes, yup. And I said, well, are you looking for like big hoops for Christmas? <laughs> like, yeah. Oh my God, Sandy. No, wait, Sandy, wait, 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 wait. We're good at, That's our gag gift. Yeah, but we're gonna do he goes, stocking. I already have hoops in. He already yeah. has hoops in? Yeah, yeah, they're probably little teeny tiny ones. He looks like a freaking pirate. Okay, he's oh my got God, like the goatee hilarious. and then the hoops. He looks like a pirate. Okay, so as a gag gift for his stocking, we're just going to fill it with um, sparkly, dangly um, earrings for him. The dazzled wreath earrings yes. for sure. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that makes me look forward to Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love my nephews. Anyway, um, so you're, you've been painting. You've been running around like a crazy person. Yeah, it was kind of a rainy day for me here. So I've been, I, I actually am like five sentences left of finishing Yay. the next calculi and then, you know, really in-depth edit to go. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I'll have to tell you a, a story afterwards, Sans. Um, yeah, I'll have to tell you a story about that afterwards. It's, yeah, I, I don't want to air dirty laundry, but there was, there was I, hit a, I hit a mercury retrograde speed bump Ooh. along the way. Okay. So okay. yeah, I thought someone understood what I was writing. Someone didn't understand what I was writing and now it's a problem. So, okay. That's always fun. Yeah, it is. I don't, I don't think it's going to be a big fix, but it's so mercury retrograde. It is so mercury retrograde. So um, just another week to go on that one. So if you've been feeling the effects of it, yep. you're preaching to the choir and we all feel, yeah, and it's duck and cover week. Yes. So yeah. Do your best to kind of um, keep your cool, people, because it's going to be challenging. That's the thing with Mercury retrograde that I've always found is that it tempts you. <laughs> well, for me, it's always crazy drivers. Like all of a sudden they come out of the woodwork and nobody looks at where they're going and they just sort of decide I'm going to go in this direction exactly. regardless of if you're there or not. So Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I know. Yeah. Um, and I've had my fair share this week of crazy drivers, but it's also like people will just do shit that um, normally I react to, but because it's mercury retrograde, I have to like switch that on and go, Oh, go, go for it. Be an asshole to me. It's fine. It's mercury retrograde. Yeah. But you know, October 2nd, no more. <laughs> <laughs> this no lid more. is going to blow. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you're kind of allowed to say anything you want to me between now and then, but be Ooh, let me get my list ready. Be <laughs> Sandy, I think it's just ongoing. Oh, know? okay. It's just an ongoing list. Yeah. <laughs> you're off there. You're off taking notes. Uh, yes. yes, I know. And I see you. I see you with my psychic guys. Um, okay, so we've got a we've got a um I love this case. I loved your write-up. Really, really dived into it. Thank you, because this was not easy. And, and I know that you've got a lot going on. Okay. Um, so I just really can't thank you enough for being as meticulous and detailed as you were. Um, it's fantastic. It's so fascinating. And um, we both have like a lot of opinions on it. Um, so let me get to book promotion first. Boop -a -doo -doo. That's my, that's my announcement for book promotion. Thank you. Boop 
Forget the sound <laughs> effects that are professionally done. Let's just use yours. Boop, ba, do, do. Yeah, exactly. No copy. Be like, what's your or theme song? Boop, do, do. <laughs> <laughs> no copyright or licensing involved. <laughs> hey, I'm going to turn it into a rap song. Boop, ba, do, do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So sense of deception is number one in the Abby Cooper series. Um, this one is based on a, on a real case. Um, I think um, I've talked about it before. It's worth mentioning again, a woman was wrongfully imprisoned for murdering her son. Um, and uh, it turned out that she did not murder her son um, and that she was basically railroaded. And I think she did end up on on death row for a period of time. Her son was, I think, eight, between eight and 10. And um, he was uh, brutally murdered while she was home. So someone climbed into his window and stabbed him. Um, and uh, the case uh, came about because they, she and her son had been, this is a while ago, so they'd been in a record store, CD store or something. They'd been looking at music and she had wandered off to her section and he was close by just look, you know, perusing through music and um, someone had settled up next to him and was chatting him up about music. And she looked at the guy and, you know, mom vibes kick in and she went and just kind of extracted him from the vicinity of this stranger. So this guy follows her home, finds out where she lives. And then that night he climbs in the window and stabs her son to death for revenge because he was offended. So um, she was finally cleared, thank God. Um, but it went, uh, it went round and round. And I think she spent a considerable amount of time. I mean, it's bad enough and it's sad enough that you lose your child, right? Single mom trying to raise her son the best she can. Um, and he's brutally murdered for just the stupidest of reasons. And, um, and then you get accused of the murder. So, um, yeah, which is interesting because we're, it's a little similar to today's case. Um, but anyway, so, um, Abby gets tossed in jail for contempt of court because her mouth kind of runs away with her. Probably it was mercury retrograde and she got tempted in front of the judge. And um, so she gets tossed in jail and she, her cellmate is actually this woman on death row who's been accused of murdering her son. But Abby's sixth sense kicks in and she, she knows that this woman did not murder her son. So the, the woman's supposed to be, her last appeal is within two weeks. And um, at the end of that, she'll have an IV in her names um if she loses the appeal and she will she, she's likely to lose the appeal by midnight so um it's race against time um so i i love you know like i, I love this book i love this book i love this book I love, but i really did i really enjoyed writing this book um uh i always like to pay an homage to real people in real cases and try and bring a little bit of reality into what i write um, to sort of ask sort of some social questions <laughs> like, you know, are we a little bit too quick to accuse women? Um, and beat up on them. Take away their rights. Ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Stop. I know. I know. It's working retrograde. I'm going down a, yeah. going down a bad path. Anyway, um, and then anecdotes this week. I had, um, I love, I love it when like I learned something from someone on the other side. So um, being able to commu with, communicate with the other side is very similar to being able to read someone's energy. <clears throat> Your brain translates uh, someone's energy, something going on in someone's energy into pictures because um, I'm clearly very clairvoyant. So um, spirit basically does the same thing because I don't, it's not like I'm hearing a conversation, they're showing me pictures. So it's a, it's a giant game of charades, which I absolutely love. So we play charades. And I will tell you, some people on the other side are fantastic at charades and some people on the other side suck at, at charades. So uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes I'm just like, I have no clue. And my client doesn't either. So we just have to leave it there. But um, so I had a gentleman, he was this woman's father. He came in and um, he was showing me train tracks and then he put a train on the train tracks and isn't it funny right next to the train and then he um made my attention go to the um engineer the train engineer right so the conductor right so i'm like what's the deal with trains she's you know and i'm like your dad keeps showing me like a train engineer and she's like oh he was an engineer right because i don't have a symbol for engineer 
you know, I mean, you can show me a nerve with glasses and a um, slide rule, but um, I probably would go math whiz, you know, but the fact that he pointed my attention specifically to the engineer, I thought was very clever. And then I had another woman um, and it was a great reading. And I've told Sandy this, but I read for a woman who was delightful and she could be Sandy's doppelganger. Ganger. Like it's uncanny how much they look alike. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so it, just, it almost felt like reading you. Um, anyway, so her father came in and he kept showing me a rolled up newspaper. And I've seen that symbol before to mean that they were written up in a newspaper. But even as I was asking her, was your dad written up in a newspaper? I felt like he was saying, no, that's wrong. And um, she said, no. And I'm like, well, he keeps showing me the newspaper and he's, I'm like, do you read newspapers? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, who reads newspapers anymore, <laughs> right? You know, we're all on our tablets or our phones, you know? And um, she said, well, he was um, in failing health. And um, when she went to visit him, she would read him the newspaper every day. Every day. So, um, so, sweet. so he was, that was his way of saying thank you hmm. for reading him the newspaper, which I thought was yeah. really sweet. So uh, those are my two anecdotes for the week. Excellent. Yeah, or the only two I remember actually. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots more, but like in one ear out the other for me. So anyway, all right, Sands, um, take it away. This is a great case. All right. So it's a long one. I'm sorry in advance. I'll do my best to not muddle it up as I go along. So this case focuses on the McDonald family murders. In the early morning hours of February 17th, 1970, U.S. Army Captain Jeffrey McDonald placed an emergency call for help to, to report that there had been stabbings in his home at, at 544 Castle Drive. After relaying the desperate situation, he asked for the Fort Bragg military police, a doctor, and an ambulance to be dispatched to his home located in the famous North Carolina military base. When the MPs arrived, they found the 26-year-old Army Special Forces physician lying next to his mortally wounded 26-year-old wife, Colette, on the blood-soaked floor of their master bedroom. Jeffrey had suffered a non-fatal puncture wound to his chest. Sadly, his two daughters, five-year-old Kimberly and two-year-old Kristen, lay dead in their respective bedrooms nearby. To date, the McDonald, the McDonald family murder case is one of the most litigated murder cases in American criminal history. While uncertainty about whether Jeffrey McDonald killed his family has prevailed for over 50 years in U.S. courts, there is no doubt that his wife and two young daughters died in pain and anguish. Born Jeffrey Robert McDonald on October 12, 1943, the second of three children to parents Robert and Dorothy, Jeffrey was raised in a poor but strongly disciplined household on Long Island, New York. During his high school years, he was very popular and served as student council president and senior prom king. But it was during his ninth grade year that he first began to date his future wife, Colette Catherine Stevenson, who was born on May 10, 1944. Typical for high schoolers, Colette broke off their relationship just before the beginning of their 10th grade fall semester. Upon graduation, Jeffrey enrolled at Princeton University as a pre-med student in 1962, and by his sophomore year, he had ended a long-term relationship with a woman named Penny Wells and soon resumed his romance with Colette, then a shy freshman at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York. Jeffrey found her timidity touching and gradually viewed himself as her protector. The two regularly exchanged letters, and he would frequently hitchhike to Skidmore College to spend the weekend. Although Jeffrey was also dating other women at the time, in August of 1963, he resolved to marry Colette because he had learned that she was pregnant with his child. With the consent of Colette's family, the couple got married on September 14th in New York City with 100 guests in attendance. After honeymoon on Cape Cod, Colette dropped out of college to set up their new home and prepare for the arrival of their baby daughter. Kimberly Catherine was born on April 18th, 1964. With his undergraduate degree from Princeton, Jeffrey moved his new family to Chicago in the summer of 1965 so he could attend Northwestern University Medical School. On May 8, 1967, the McDonald's added another girl to their family, Kristen Jean. After graduate, graduating from Northwestern, the McDonald's relocated to Bergenfeld, New Jersey, so Jeffrey could complete a one-year internship at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York, specializing in thoracic surgery. He later described his internship year as horrendous because he frequently worked 36-hour shifts, leaving him too exhausted to bond and interact with his family. Following a much-needed vacation in Aruba with Colette, Jeffrey enlisted in the U.S. Army on June 28, 1969, and was sent to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, to undergo a six-week physician's basic training course. While there, he volunteered to become a Special Forces physician with the Army's Green Berets. 
After completing paratrooper training at Fort Benning, Georgia, in late August of 1969, the first lieutenant reported to the Airborne Third Special Forces Group at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, to serve as the group's surgeon. Colette and his daughters soon followed, and the family took up residence at 544 Castle Drive in a section of the base reserved for married officers. Colette was excited that she had, at this point in time, only two years left of special studies to secure her BA in English literature, and she had plans once she graduated to use her degree to teach part-time. Their daughters were known to be complete opposites. Kimberly was very feminine, shy, and intelligent, and her toddler sister Kristen was bold, boisterous, and a tomboy. On December 10th, the 3rd Special Forces Group was deactivated, and Jeffrey was transferred to base headquarters to serve as a preventative medical officer with the 6th Special Forces Group. In her annual Christmas letter, Colette shared with her friends that her life had never been so normal or happy as she now found it with Jeffrey and the girls at Fort Bragg. She also noted that she and Jeffrey were expecting a baby boy in July, making her family complete. By early 1970, Jeffrey had earned the rank of captain. He was planning to study advanced medical training at Yale University upon completion of his tour of duty as a Green Beret doctor and anticipated moving the family to a spacious farm in Connecticut. On the afternoon of February 16th, Jeffrey took his daughters to feed and ride the pony he had gifted them for Christmas. The trio then returned home at about 5.45 p.m., and after the family ate dinner together, Colette left the house to attend classes at Fort Bragg's North Carolina University Extension. According to Jeffrey, he played with his daughters for a short while before he put Kristen to bed at approximately 7 p.m. He then napped for an hour and woke up in time to watch Lappin with Kimberly before she also went to bed. Colette returned home at 9.40 p.m. and joined her husband on the couch to watch TV. Midway through The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson, Colette grew sleepy and retired to bed. Exhausted from the day's events, Jeffrey again fell asleep on the living room couch. At 3.42 a.m. on February 17, 1970, dispatchers at Fort Bragg received an emergency phone call from Captain McDonald yelping, Help! 544 Castle Drive! Stabbing! 544 Castle Drive! Stabbing! Hurry! The operator then heard the receiver clatter against a wall or the floor. MPs arrived at the McDonald's home within 10 minutes of Jeffrey's phone call and found the front door locked and the house dark. When no one answered the front door, the MPs went around to the back of the house, where a police sergeant found the back door wide open. Upon entering, the sergeant walked into the master bedroom and then ran to the front of the house, shouting, Tell them to get Womack ASAP. Colette was discovered on the floor of the master bedroom, laying sprawled on her back with one eye open. She had been repeatedly clubbed about her body and her blo and the blows bo broke both of her forearms, indicating that they were defensive wounds. In addition, she had been stabbed 21 times in the chest with an ice pick and 16 times about the neck and chest with a knife, which severed her trachea in two places. A bloodied and torn pajama top was draped upon her chest and a paring knife lay beside her body. Jeffrey was found alive, lying face down with his head on Colette's chest and one arm around her neck. As military personnel approached, he whispered, Check my kids. I heard my kids crying. Five-year-old Kimberly was found in her bed, laying on her side. Like Colette, the preschooler had been stabbed in the neck with a knife between eight and ten times and bludgeoned repeatedly, suffering blows to her small head and body. At least two blows to the right side of her head fractured her skull and broke her cheekbone. The wounds she suffered were severe and resulted in her death soon after being inflicted. Across the hallway, two-year-old Kristen was also found in her bed, lying on her left side with a baby bottle close to her mouth. She had been stabbed with a knife 33 times across the chest, neck, hands, and back, and an additional 15 times with an ice pick. MPs tending to Jeffrey noticed that on the headboard of the McDonald's marital bed, the word pig was written in Colette's blood in eight-inch capital letters. Having received impromptu resuscitation, Jeffrey sat upright and cried out, Jesus Christ, look at my wife. I'm going to kill those goddamn acid heads. As he was carried out of the home on a stretcher to be transported to nearby Womack Hospital, Jeffrey wailed, let me see my kids. At Womack Army Medical Center, medical staff treated the captain's superficial wounds, cuts and bruises and fingernail scratches to his face and chest. He'd also suffered a mild concussion and a single stab wound between two ribs on his right torso, which had caused his lung to partially collapse. The staff surgeon described it as a clean, small, sharp incision, incision measuring five-eighths of an inch deep. Overall, Jeffrey's wounds were minimal and significantly less severe than those inflicted upon his wife and children. At the start of his nine-day hospital stay, the captain eagerly agreed to be questioned by the Criminal Investigation Division, which is CID. He recounted to investigators that at about 2 a.m. on February 17th, he had washed the evening's dinner dishes before retiring to the master bedroom. When he discovered that his youngest daughter, Kristen, 
who, after crawling into bed with Colette, had wet his side of the bed, he picked up his sleeping daughter, put her in her own bed. But then he worried that he would wake Colette if he changed the sheets. So instead, he grabbed a blanket from Kristen's room and fell asleep on the living room couch. According to Jeffrey, he was later awakened by Kimberly and Colette's screams and heard Colette shouting, Jeff, Jeff, help! Why are they doing this to me? As he jumped up from the couch to help his wife, he was attacked by three male intruders, one black and two white. The shorter of the two white men had worn lightweight surgical gloves. He also described a fourth intruder as a white female with long blonde hair, possibly a wig, and wearing high-heeled, knee-high boots with a white floppy hat, which partially covered her face. She stood nearby holding a lighted candle chanting, acid is groovy, kill the pigs. Jeffrey stated that the three males then attacked him with a club and an ice pick and were egged on by the female intruder shouting, hit him again. During the struggle, his pajama top was pulled up over his head and, down, and then down to his wrists, which he used to, defensively to ward off thrusts from an ice pick. Eventually, his assailants knocked him unconscious and he dropped to the floor in the living room and to the hallway leading to the bedrooms. By the time he regained consciousness, the intruders had left the house. He then stumbled from room to room, attempting to resuscitate each of his daughters, but to no avail, but, and then before discovering Colette on the floor of the master bedroom. He pulled a small protruding paring knife from Colette's chest, tossed it aside, and attempted to, but could not find her pulse. He then draped his pajama top over her partially nude body and phoned for help. When, within minutes of the discoveries at Castle Drive, military police were instructed to check the occupants of all vehicles in and around Fort Bragg, seeking to apprehend the two white men, one black man, and a white woman with blonde hair and a floppy hat that Captain McDonald alleged had attacked him and his family. With no results, that initiative was abandoned by 6 a.m. Shortly thereafter, right outside the McDonald's back door, investigators recovered the murder weapons, including an old hickory kitchen knife, an ice pick, and a 31-inch long piece of lumber, all of which were determined to have come from the McDonald home. Jeffrey claimed to have never seen these items. And while all the weapons had been wiped clean of fingerprints, the lumber had two blue threads attached by blood. As investigators studied the crime scene, CID quickly concluded that the physical evidence collected at the scene did not line up with Captain McDonald's account of the events surrounding the early morning hours of February 17th. Despite his extensive training in unarmed combat, the living room area where Jeffrey supposedly fought for his life against three armed assailants showed few signs of such a desperate battle. The only damage to the room, the room was an upended coffee table and flower pot and magazines strewn about the floor. Further, there were no fibers found from Jeffrey's torn pajama top in the living room where he professed to have struggled with intruders, but instead his pajama top fibers were discovered beneath Colette's body and in the bedrooms of both of his daughters and one fiber from this garment was also retrieved from under Kristen's fingernail. Bloodstained splinters from the 31-inch long piece of lumber used to bludgeon the McDonald girls were recovered from all three bedrooms of the home, but not one from the living room where the captain claimed to have been attacked. Further, both house telephones, one of which the captain used to call for help, were free of blood and fingerprints, which should have been present if he had done as he reported to have in attempting to check for Collect's pulse and resuscitated his daughters. Although it had rained on the night of February 16th, 17th, the sole footprint observed at the scene was a bloody bare footprint located in Kristen's bedroom, leading from the child's bed in the direction of the bedroom doorway. Finally, beneath the master bedroom headboard, where the blood inscription was written in Colette's blood, the bloodstained tip of a surgical glove was found. This glove was identical in composition to a medical supply the captain kept in the kitchen. None of the neighbors heard sounds of a struggle or disturbance within the McDonald household during the early morning hours of February 17th, but some did say they had heard Colette shouting in an angry and loud voice. Based upon these findings, on February 23rd, the Fort Bragg Provost Marshal advised the FBI to discontinue their search for four intruders that Captain McDonald stated had murdered his family. About a month after the murders, CID had the results back of the on the forensic testing of the blood, hair, and fiber samples retrieved from 544 Castle Drive. The report contradicted the captain's account and further convinced investigators that he was the sole person responsible for the murders of his wife and two daughters. Interestingly, all four members of the McDonald family had a different blood type, which enabled investigators to determine the movements of each member around the household and their subsequent theory as to the likely scenario of the unfolding events in the early morning hours of February 17th. Investigators posited that an argument between Jeffrey and Colette began in the master bedroom, possibly over the issue of Kristen wetting Jeffrey's side of the bed, and that the fight turned physical. Investigators speculated that Colette threw a hairbrush at Jeffrey, which bumped him on the forehead. 
Enraged, Jeffrey retaliated by hitting Colette, Colette first with his fist and then pummeled her with a piece of lumber he'd retrieved from the mattress slat on Kimberly's bed. Five-year-old Kimberly, whose blood and brain matter were found in the master bedroom doorway, may have walked in on her father beating her mother and was possibly struck at least once in the head by accident. Believing Colette dead, Jeffrey carried the mortally wounded Kimberly back to her bedroom. And after bludgeoning and stabbing her to death, Jeffrey moved on to Kristen's room, intent of, on disposing of the last remaining witness to his murderous crime. But before he could execute his baby daughter, Colette, whose blood was found on Kristen's bed covers and on one wall of her room, apparently had regained consciousness, and she stumbled into her younger daughter's bedroom and threw her own body over Kristen in a desperate attempt to protect her. After killing Kristen and finishing off Colette, Jeffrey wrapped his wife's body in a sheet and carried her back to the master bedroom. As he exited Kristen's bedroom, he unknowingly left a smudged bloody footprint, which matched Colette's blood type. Putting on surgical gloves from a medical supply in the kitchen closet, Jeffrey returned to the master bedroom where he used Colette's blood to write the word pig on the headboard. He then laid his torn pajama top over the dead body and repeatedly stabbed her in the chest with an ice pick and then wiped clean the kitchen knife, ice pick, and bloody piece of lumber and disposed of his weapons just outside of the back door of his house. Finally, he grabbed a scalpel blade from the supply closet, entered the hallway bathroom, and stabbed himself once in the chest while standing over the sink. He then disposed of his surgical gloves, used the telephone to call for help, and laid down next to Colette to wait for the arrival of the military police. On April 6, 1970, Army investigators formally cautioned and then interrogated Captain McDonald, during which time he was offered the opportunity to recount his version of the events that occurred on February 17th. Despite learning about the forensic evidence investigators had collected from his home and pressed about the implausibility of his story, particularly in terms of the overkill of his wife and daughters compared to the minor injuries he had sustained, but the captain denied that he had anything to do with the murders of his family. At the end of a very long day of questioning, Captain McDonald was relieved of his duties and placed under restriction pending further inquiries. On April 10th, Jeffrey dismissed his army lawyer and hired civilian defense attorney Bernard Siegel. After being formally charged on May 1st with three counts of murder, the Army conducted a pre-trial hearing known as an Article 32 investigation that lasted from July 6th to S September 11th, 1970. According to Attorney Siegel, skillfully used an offensive strategy by citing numerous examples of incompetence by the Army's MPs and CID, including the fact that they compromised evidence from the crime scene, lost critical evidence, a failure by pathologists to obtain the McDonald children's fingerprints for com comparison and testimony from an ambulance driver who admitted to stealing the captain's wallet from the living room on the night in the question. The first witness to t testify in Jeffrey's defense was military policeman Kenneth Mika, who shared that on the way to answering McDonald's emergency call on the night of the murders, he had observed a blonde woman with a wide brimmed hat standing on a street corner approximately a half a mile from the McDonald home, which was unusual given the late hour and the rainy weather. In August, Attorney Siegel was approached by a delivery man named William Posey, who suggested that the blonde woman Jeffrey had claimed was part of a group that had attacked as a family was in fact a local 17-year-old drug addict and police informant named Helena Stockley. Helena was known to have worn a blonde wig, boots, and a large floppy hat, and according to Posey, Helena had been in the company of two or three young males in a car parked outside of her apartment at approximately 4 a.m. on the morning of the murders. Posey also reported that Helena did not know, nor did she remember what she did on the night in question, and that Helena had told him that she and a boyfriend could not marry until we go out and kill some more people. When Helena was questioned by authorities about her whereabouts on February 17th, her answers were vague and contradictory. She recalled being in the company of her boyfriend, Gregory Mitchell, on the night of, the, of February 16th, and going out for a ride in a car in the early hours of the 17th. But because she was so high on mescaline, she couldn't say for sure whether she had been at the McDonald house or not. Although witnesses had claimed that Helena had admitted her involvement in the murders, with several also remembering her wearing similar clothing to that described by Jeffrey McDonald on the date in question, she was not subpoenaed to testify. And this procedural irregular irregularity was highlighted by attorney Siegel at Jeffrey's hearing. Following favorable character testimony from several acquaintances and a military psychiatrist, Jeffrey testified for three days in mid-August. Sections of his testimony contradicted what he had informed investigators of on April 6th, including that he had laid Colette's body flat on the floor after discovering her propped up against a chair in their bedroom. He also stated that due to his surgical background, he had washed his hands in the bathroom before he checked 
out his own injuries, and then again before he called emergency services. Despite admitting that he'd been unfa unfaithful on two occasions, Jeffrey shared that his time with Colette at Fort Bragg had been the happiest period of their marriage. At the conclusion of Jeffrey's testimony, a clinical psychologist was questioned regarding a series of tests that he'd admitted to the captain, which revealed an extraordinary absence of anxiety, depression, and or anger in McDonald regarding the loss of his family. The expert concluded that Jeffrey was able to muster massive denial or repression to such a degree that the impact of the recent events in his life had been blunted. Furthermore, <clears throat> this extreme psychological response would likely see an individual convey himself as victimized and perhaps a martyr. Surprisingly, on October 13, 1970, Colonel Rock issued a report recommending that charges be dismissed against Captain McDonald due to insufficient evidence that proved his guilt and added no truth existed in the charges. The nature of the murders led Rock to believe that the perpetrators were either insane or under the influence of drugs. So Rock recommended that civilian authorities for, um, further investigate Helena Stokely. After all charges were formally dismissed against Jeffrey McDonald, he received an honorable just discharge from the army in December of 1970. Within days of their dismissal and amidst strong public support, Jeffrey began granting press interviews and media appearances, including the December 15, 1970 episode of The Dick Gavitt Show. During his time with Cabot, Jeffrey spoke harshly about the Army investigation and claimed to have sustained 23 wounds, some of which were considered potentially fatal. Eager to put the trauma behind him in July of 1971, Jeffrey relocated to Long Beach, California, and secured a position as an ER physician at St. Mary Medical Center. He also became an instructor at the UCL UCLA Medical School, a medical director of the Long Beach Grand Prix, a lecturer on the subject of recognition and treatment of child abuse, and a participant in the development of a national cardiopulmonary resuscitation training program. By the late 1970s, Jeffrey had formed a long-term relationship with Candy Kramer, a 22-year-old flight attendant. Throughout the Army investigation and subsequent hearing, Jeffrey maintained the support of Colette's parents, her mother, Mildred, and, his, and her stepfather, Alfred Kasib. However, once Jeffrey began granting media interviews to publicly describe his experience, Alfred became aware of the glaring inconsistencies in Jeffrey's account of what happened in the early morning hours of February 17th that resulted in the murder of his granddaughters and stepdaughter. As a result, Alfred reviewed the Article 32 hearing transcript in great detail and then traveled to Fort Bragg to tour the crime scene at 544 Castle Drive. He also discovered that within weeks of the murders, Jeffrey had begun dating a young woman employed at Fort Bragg, and in late 1969, he had rekindled his relationship with his college sweetheart, Penny Wells. Convinced now of his son-in-law's guilt, Alfred resolved to devote his life to pursuing all legal avenues to bring Jeffrey McDonald to justice, which at the time, his only legal option was to file a citizen's complaint through the U.S. Department of Justice, and he did so in early 1972. Unfortunately, given that the murders had occurred while Jeffrey was serving in the U.S. Army, and he had since been discharged, the citizen's complaint was declared moot, and as such, the FBI declined to take on the case. Undeterred, Alfred continued to push for justice, and finally on April 3, 1974, the case of his attorney, Richard Kahn, presented a citizen's complaint against McDonald to the U.S. Chief District Court Judge. One month later, the Justice Department determined that the case was worthy of prosecution. On August 12, 1974, a grand jury convened in Raleigh, North Carolina, and after hearing from 75 witnesses, including Jeffrey McDonald himself, on January 24, 1975, the grand jury formally indicted him on three counts of murder. An hour after the indictment was issued, he was arrested at his residence in California. On January 31, 1975, he was freed on a $100,000 bail that was raised by friends and colleagues. At his arraignment on May 23, he entered a plea of not guilty. And over the course of the next three years, Jeffrey fought the legality of his indictment based on double jeopardy, during which time the indictment was dismissed. However, an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court on May 1, 1978, resulted in the reinstatement of the, re of the indictment. Finally, Jeffrey McDonald was brought to trial on July 6, 1979 in Raleigh, North Carolina, to face charges for three counts of murder. Represented once again by Bernie Siegel, Jeffrey entered a plea of not guilty. During the trial, the prosecution focused their case on the abundant physical and circumstantial evidence that pointed to Jeffrey McDonald's guilt, and that the evidence clearly indicated that one person, not two, not three, not four or more, killed Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen. The defense emphasized two key points. 
that the army investigation hopefully compromise, hopelessly compromised the crime scene and that following the 1970 Article 32 hearing, all charges had been dropped against Jeffrey McDonald for the murder of his young family. The defense further promoted the fact that Jeffrey had no history of violence or domestic abuse against his wife or children and therefore had no motive to kill his beloved family. One of the final witnesses called to testify by the defense was Helena Stockley. Intent on extracting a confession, a confession from her that she had been one of the intruders Jeffrey claimed had murdered his family, Helena surprised the defense by denying any culpability in the murders and of having any knowledge of who may have committed the acts. Insistent that she was unable to recall her whereabouts on the date of the murders, Helena emphasized her extensive drug use in 1970, and adding the night of February 16th, 17th in 1970 was by no means the first or last night in which she was unable to recall her whereabouts. The final defense witness called to testify was Jeffrey McDonald. Under oath, his legal team served out questions designed to humanize Jeffrey with tales and descriptions of the happy life he had shared with Colette while raising their family. He then testified that the reason he had relocated to California was so he could distance himself from well-wishers and that he typically worked up to 80 hours a week to distract himself from thinking about his family. Under cross-examination, Jeffrey was unable to clarify the contradictions between the forensic and physical evidence found at the crime scene versus his account of the events and his movements and his injuries that he experienced on February 17, 1970. Following closing arguments, the jury was instructed to either find Jeffrey McDonald not guilty to find him guilty of first-degree murder or guilty of second-degree murder in each case. Shortly after 4 p.m. on August 29, 1979, the jury, having deliberated for six and a half hours, found Jeffrey guilty of one count of first-degree murder in the death of Kristen and two counts of second-degree murder in the deaths of Colette and Kimberly. The judge revoked his bail and imposed a life sentence for each of the murders to be served consecutively at a federal correctional institution in T-Terminal Island, California. On July 29, 1980, a panel of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed McDonald's conviction, ruling that the nine-year delay in bringing him to trial violated his Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial. Following his release on August 22, Jeffrey returned to work as the Director of Emergency Medicine at St. Mary's Medical Center in Long Beach, California. Two years later, in March of 1982, Jeffrey announced his engagement to his fiancée, fiance, Randy D. Markwith. The overturned conviction decision was appealed twice, and on May 26, 1981, the U.S. Supreme Court accepted the case for consideration, with oral arguments scheduled for December 7th. On March 31, 1982, the Supreme Court ruled 6-3 to three that McDonald's rights to a speedy trial had not been violated under the Sixth Amendment. Jeffrey was rearrested and returned to federal prison to serve out his original sentence of three consecutive life terms. Despite a series of appeals filed between June of 1982 and September 2021, all of which were denied, including a motion for compassionate release, Jeffrey McDonald remains incarcerated at the Federal Correctional Institution in Cumberland, Maryland. He will turn 79 on October 12, 2022. To this day, Jeffrey McDonald remains determined to clear his name. He contends that an unidentified fingerprint and fiber evidence recovered from inside his home has never been matched to any individual known to have been on the premises prior to or after the murders and, the, and that these findings are evidence of his claim of home intruders. So some additional facts to consider here are that Helena Stockley was interviewed by a retired FBI special agent and private investigator, Ted Gunderson in August of 1980. During that interview, Helena confessed that she and five members of what she described a drug cult had developed a deep grudge against McDonald because he'd refused to treat heroin and opium addicted patients. So she and other members of the drug cult plotted to murder McDonald's family, but to leave him alive. According to Helena, late on the evening of February 16, 1970, she had telephoned the McDonald residence to confirm that the family was home. The, the, the group then dropped some mescaline, drove to the McDonald's house, and upon entry, Helena and four others confronted McDonald to demand a dexedrine prescription. The situation quickly escalated as McDonald fought against his attackers until he was knocked unconscious. Hel Helena then ran to the master bedroom to find death to all pigs or something like that scrawled on the headboard and two of her friends bludgeoning Colette on the bed as her child lay asleep next to her. Helena was adamant that she'd had, had worn a beige floppy hat on the evening in question. Helena submitted to a polygraph test in April of 1971 with the military examiner stating uh, his conclusion that Helena was convinced in her mind that she knew the identity of the people who killed Colette, Kimberly, 
and Christine and that she was physically present at the time of the murders. However, the examiner did not detect any abnormal psychological responses in polygraph tracings, and due to Helena's admitted confused state of mind and her excessive drug use during and immediately following the homicides in question, a conclusion could not be reached as to whether or not she in fact knew who committed the homicides or whether she in fact was present at the scene of the murders. Despite the fact that Helena's hair sample and fingerprints did not match any that were found at the crime scene, Jeffrey McDonald's legal team pursued a series of appeals to revisit Helena's supposed com confession to the murders. Each appeal was denied, and the matter was concluded in November of 2008 when Judge James Carroll Fox ruled that Helena had made several contradictory statements regarding her participation, or lack thereof, in the murders, and her claims were unreliable. This ruling was upheld again in 2014 when the matter was once again appealed. <clears throat> the facts for and against... Jeffrey McDonald had been hashed out since 1970 in news accounts, at least five books on television and in modern times on websites and in true crime pod podcasts, two that stand out. In 1979, Jeffrey McDonald invited author Joe McGinnis to write a book about his case for which he was given full ac access to Jeffrey and his defense team during the July 1979 trial. The book McGinnis authored, Fatal Vision, portrays Jeffrey McDonald as a narcissistic sociopath who was guilty of murdering, murdering his family and believed in his abilities to deceive law enforcement, friends, and family, and the public about his crimes. The book includes a 1979 report by psychologist Hirsch Lazar Silverman, who found that Jeffrey handled his conflicts by denying that they even existed, and that he lacked any sense of guilt, and that he could commit asocial acts with impunity, and that he had been incapable of forming emotionally close relationships with females of any age. Silverman also noted that Jeffrey had dodged and resented his commitments as a husband and a father, and that given his ongoing denial of truth, he would continually seek both attention and approval. Fatal Vision also offered a positive mot possible motive for the killings, which attributed Jeffrey's habitual use of Escatrol, an, an amphetamine used for weight loss, which was part of a weight control program for his Green Beret unit. And that caused a spur of the moment psychotic rage, which was es exacerbated by his lack of sleep from his extensive professional and family commitments. Another book, A Wilderness of Error, in 2012 was published by a documentary filmmaker, Errol Morris, which explored the questions surrounding Jeffrey McDonald's conviction. His book was made into a five-part documentary series that was recently released in 2020 on the FX Next Network. After all of this, Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen McDonald were laid to rest side by side in Washington Memorial Park in Suff Suffolk County, Long Island on February 23, 1970. Each grave was initially inscribed with the surname McDonald, although the gravestones were later changed to Colette's maiden name of Stevenson. In January of 1983, Helena Stokely, Stokely sorry, was found dead in her Seneca, South Carolina apartment at the young age of 30. Autopsy results indicated that she had died of acute pneumonia and psoriasis. Colette's, Colette McDonald's mother and stepfather, Mildred and Alfred Kasev, both died in 1994, Mildred on January 19th and Alfred on October 24th. In August of 2002, McDonald married a former children's drama school owner-operator named Catherine Courage. So the story still stands that he's in prison. He wanted compassionate release. He was denied, and he's mm -hmm. still serving his life sentence. Good. My Sorry, my sources for this story are Wikipedia, Jeffrey R. McDonald, The Fayetteville Observer, <laughs> Judge Rejects Release for Fatal Vision and Murder Defendant, Jeffrey McDonald, by Paul Warwolston of USA Today Network on April 9, 2021, and The Fayetteville Observer, Jeffrey McDonald, Case Intrigues 50 Years Later, again by Paul Warwolston, February 19, 2020. So. I got it right. Yeah, he did it. Like, you know, there's, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that he did it. The whole um, Helena and the floppy hat thing. I think that that woman was um, very troubled mentally. Yeah. Um, I think um, if you're a hardcore drug addict at 17, that's going to do some physiological damage to your brain. Um, and I think that she was very easily impressionable. And I think that um, the defense team for Jeffrey had some influence there. So I think that she craved attention and um, was kind of willing to put herself in the middle of this drama, but under no circumstances do I feel that she was there. So <clears throat> let's go back to the scene of the crime. Well, actually the very first instant 
that I was like, boom, my feelers went boom, was when Jeffrey was recalling how at 2 a.m. he was doing the dishes and then he went in um, to go to sleep in his bed and uh, Kimberly had wet the bed. And then he, you know, he picks her up gently and takes her to bed and tucks her in, you know, and then he goes and sleeps out in the living room. So bullshit. He uh, found that she wet the bed. He's exhausted. He's working these long hours. He is absolutely a narcissistic, probably a malignant narcissist, um, which means that he's got sociopathic tendencies or psych um, psychopathic uh, tendencies. And um, which means um, basically that he does not experience guilt and that um, he can, you know, be driving around with a body in the trunk and heart rate's fine, can be pulled over by a cop and not even flinch. So I don't think that um, it bothered him at all, at all, because he started dating a couple of weeks right after these murders, right? And then, you know, he goes on and he's working a lot. In very heroic capacities, by the way, you know, yeah, got exactly. like a huge caseload right? of things to do when he moved to California. So yeah, just ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. Um, they always, you know, painting himself in a, in the bright light, you know, this victim, and yet he's functioning fine. Mm -hmm. There's like no PTSD. There's no, you know, trauma. Um, it's so staged. It was so ridiculous. So I went, through the crime scene photos because I sometimes get a lot, of, a lot of vibes from the crime scene photos. And um, the houses, so there are a lot of um, photographs of the exterior of the house. And the houses are actually, the housing are actually, they're connected. So they look like uh, townhomes kind of connected, yeah. right? So yeah. there's two front, front doors right next to each other. This, these were probably built in the 1950s, 1960s maybe, okay, these, these homes. We're not talking lots of insulation in the walls at all, right? So if you walk in the front door and it's the two front doors that are next to each other on these townhomes, you walk into the living room. So if they're, if his neighbors to the left were, I don't think there were neighbors to the right. I'm pretty sure there weren't neighbors, like it wasn't connected on the right. I don't know, I'll have to look. But um, on the left was where they should have heard this whole commotion, right? And um, they heard, uh, Colette loud and angry voice, but they didn't hear the scuffle or the um, trauma drama that was going on in the living room. So this idea that these four or five people crashed into his home, bypass him initially, right? Sleeping on the couch to go straight for the girls' rooms and Colette's room, right? Really? You're not going to take out the guy on the couch first? Like that's not your first victim? His superficial wounds, laughable, laughable. He's in a knife fight with someone, right? And all he has is, as protection are, is his pajama top. And the pajama top is showing 48 stab wounds, 48, 48. So you're telling me like his arms weren't completely shredded? Yeah, it was actually um, puncture wounds from the ice pick. Yeah, the ice pick, okay. Yeah, versus a knife. It was an ice pick that penetrated the... Um, pajama top. Right, right. And then the coffee table, if you look at the, the photo of the coffee table, it is turned on its side. So you've got a scuffle going, right? The coffee table is probably shin height, knee height at the most. You've got a scuffle going on. How does that fucker get turned on its side? Like, how does that happen? Right? Is it getting shoved I could see it being destroyed. Destroyed for sure. It looked super flimsy, like uh, wooden slats. You know? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's not going to be just turned on its side, right? Because, Gently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's yeah. a slight angle to the couch. Where was the scuffle taking place? You know, there wasn't a lot of, this living room was small. It was small and it was cluttered. So there's a television, there's a bookcase, there's um, potted plants all over the place. And yet the only thing disturbed basically is this coffee table and the no magazines and magazines that were on the coffee table. Yeah. So, um, so that's ridiculous. Um, the bloody footprint, his bloody footprint in, uh, Kimberly's Kimberly's room or Christian's room, Kimberly's room, right? I think so. Yeah. Kimberly's room. I mean, 
it was raining outside. There's no mud tracked in. What did these guys take their shoes off at the back door? And the fact that the back door was wide open and the they didn't go out the front. They they were like, no, let's go back out the back, you know, because that's that's that takes longer. Like mm-hmm. it's it's so ridiculous. The fact that the phone was wiped clean. The fact that the hairbrush that collect threw at him, and I do believe she did, um, was wiped clean. Um, the fact that the um, wound up pajama top that was um, scrunched up on top of Colette, the stab wounds with the ice pick matched the stab wounds in her chest. So she mm-hmm. had all of these small stab wounds in her chest and, and it matched. When they reconstructed how the pajama top was folded on top of her, they matched. So the 48 stab wounds were probably closer to like 24 um, where the pajama top was folded over because it was scrunched up, right? So uh, that's that. And then there, there's a crime scene photo and, and I don't recommend that anybody go and look at these photos because they are very graphic and there are photos of the children and they're, they're, distur- they're really disturbing. They're really upsetting. So if you have children, please don't go looking at these um, photos. They will give you nightmares. Um, but the photo of Kimberly, she's tucked in bed. So she is brutally beaten and stabbed, you know, and the only, the blood loss is underneath these covers. What? <laughs> right? So you brutally beat this five-year-old and then you go, oh, let's cover her up. Let's, let's tuck her in bed. You're a stranger, high on mescaline? No, you're her father creating a scene? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. And the fact that both girls were stabbed like on their chest and face up, right? And yet they were both found on their sides as if they were sleeping, tucked in. Ridiculous. Like it's ridiculous. Um, The whole thing about how Jeffrey found Colette's demeanor, um, her timidity touching. Yeah. She was easily controlled. Yeah. So he's a he's a, a malignant narcissist, and he's controlling her, and he found that cool. So my thinking is exactly what the um, was it the FBI who went back and they were like, "This is how it happened." I can't remember who went back. It was CID went, that did that. CID, yeah. yeah. So I believe that they nailed it. I believe they nailed it. So I think that he goes into the bedroom, finds that Kimberly has wet the bed, slaps her, hits her, punches her, loses it. Colette wakes up. She is undone by the fact that he's beating her daughter. They get into it. Um, She's trying to defend her daughter. Then she's trying to defend herself. He grabs a board, starts bludgeoning her. Um, His daughter, Kimberly, is still in the room and he whacks her, right? Thinks he's killed. Colette is like, okay, now I got to clean up the mess. So he takes uh Kimberly back to her room she's probably knocked unconscious at that point and brutally beats her and stabs her to death and then he takes care of uh Kristen and then the whole thing with Colette waking up her blood was found on top of Kimberly's um pajama top which remember Kimberly was tucked in bed so how did how the fuck did that happen you know, the fact that all four people had separate blood types, that's a boon. That is, wow, that's lucky. So none of the crime scene matches what's feasible, reasonable. It's all this convoluted bullshit. And then there's um, something else that I found online that I felt rang a really um, big bell of truth with me. It's that um, Jeffrey had been looking at a magazine that covered the Manson. So Esquire man- magazine. Yeah. Been it was found edition. in the home. Yeah. Yeah. With yeah. a bloody footprint or bloody thumbprint on it. Oh yeah. I didn't know that there was a bloody, there was I a bloody read that that had been there, but yeah, I didn't on the top of the, of, on the top of the magazine. Yeah. So, um, so he had been looking through, right. Mm-hmm. Trying to refresh his memory of, okay, how did the Manson murders go down? Right. Yep. Also why pig? He's not a cop. Yeah, I know. That's you know? clearly he didn't understand what he was. Right. It's yeah. just like, well, you know, this will be linked to Manson. The other thing is there's no, there's no, that they're on a military base, right? You would think that if there was some sort of violent cult on a military be- base, you know, the, the gossip central, 
yeah. right? They're all, it's a close knit community. They're going to talk about the, the um, cult, right? So Manson cultivate a, a cult to go and commit these terrible murders, right? You're telling me that this same thing happened um, thousands of miles away, but yet no one is reporting any mastermind of this cult, except for Helena, who's 17. I mean, really? I know. It's just, it's so absurd how ridiculous the case is because the circumstantial evidence from what I can see is beyond, it's beyond convincing. Um, well, what's so puzzling to me is why did the provost dismiss the case? You know, the, the CID had all this evidence and granted um, the, civil, the, the civilian attorney, the defense attorney did a really good job of kind of muddying the waters, but. Mm -hmm. Well, remember I, that his bail. No, was this raised. was, no, no, this was, this was the first hearing in the, with the army. Oh, okay. Why was it dismissed? I think yeah. probably because the army didn't, first of all, you can't like to fathom that a father murdered his kids is really just, it's so beyond any sane person's um, empathetic person's ability to even imagine that um, there's gotta be an alternative story. And the, the and that the murders were so brutal. They were, yeah. Right? Yeah. You can't fathom a loving father committing those murders, but he wasn't loving. He was a malignant narcissist. So it's that missed understanding of exactly what Jeffrey was, psychologically speaking, that I think they were like, you know, this loving father could never have done this because it's, and he's a doctor, he's a respected surgeon. No, it's not possible. But you know, what's funny is that um, <laughs> the uh, number of psychopaths that run CEOs that run large organizations and are surgeons is like big. <laughs> yeah, it's high. They're not all violent, but they are, they don't feel, they have no empathy. They have no sympathy. They don't care. Um, if they, you know, cause pain doesn't, doesn't affect them the way it does normal people. So, um, so yeah, I think he was a malignant narcissist and, um, within that definition is, um, uh, sociopathic um, or psychopathic. So sociopaths are made, psychopaths are born. Um, who cares? It's tomato, tomato. Um, so yeah, it's just, I've always known he did it. I've always known he did it. And I do remember the movie. What was the movie scenes? Fatal Vision. It was based on McGinnis's book. Yeah. yeah I remember that movie and um, they did a great job. I thought they really did a great job mm -hmm. because they took what um cid said happened and they like gave you sort of two two versions jeffrey's version and then their version and um they kind of just really stuck to what had happened what each had claimed happened mm -hmm. and i remember you know, i was like you know pretty young like this aired in what the 80s early you're late asking, 70s early 80s <laughs> like i remember being young yeah um and uh a long time ago when I rode my dinosaur back um, to in school. the 1900s <laughs> back before the wheel was invented um, <laughs> um yeah so I remember that the movie and I remember even then going no he absolutely 100% he did it yeah. like he absolutely there's never been a doubt in my mind that he did it it just is and that it's even a question is sort of that's that's what confuses me is that there's even still sort of a question because it's just so clear it's just so plain and i don't know that you have to necessarily be psychic but um to me it's just so fucking obvious. well i think what's interesting is that he was lucky as yes. a criminal he was very lucky as a criminal he was. the fact that that uh you know he probably did see helena in the neighborhood at some point in time became a convenient i think he saw her that night i think on his way home i think he saw her okay so, so it became a convenient story to, to spin. Right. And then right. uh, he had a very clever attorney. Right. You know, he was smart in, in firing the army attorney that had been assigned to him and instead uh, took a civilian attorney on who was used to litigating cases like this. Right. So he um, the doubt. Yep. And, and, and then Jeffrey has continually pushed that doubt mm -hmm. to court after court. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's the most litigated case in U.S. criminal history. Mm -hmm. uh, he just will not let it go. Mm -hmm. I think he's convinced himself he's innocent. 
Well, if you think of another very prominent malignant narcissist, not naming names, but someone else that is convincing of a big lie, pushing that unceasingly, even yeah. in the face of all evidence to the contrary. Yep. Yeah. Not backing well, down. So, you know, it, it, you can see the display. You can see why he's still pushing it. Because if he could convince one person, he feels he could convince many more. Yeah. But um, no, no, you can't. Because I really feel like juries put, turn on their own intuition. Because they kind of have to, you know? So their own radar is like, something's false about that. Something doesn't, just doesn't ring true. And when you take the totality of the evidence and you look at it, it's just, to me, it's so overwhelmingly obvious that he did it, um, that he snapped, he was sleep deprived. Um, and then the drug that he was on that rang my bell of truth too. Yeah. The amphetamine. And yeah. Amphetamine. Yeah. I yeah. was, I, I felt like that there was something there. So um, I think that that, that the idea that he was on an amphetamine and it sort of helped remove any um, caution or any um, hesitancy on his part to commit these murders. He just flashed and went, went at it. And the fact that his wife that he verbally controlled, right? Her timidity, um, fucker, um, uh, got in his face. That would totally enrage him because if he's a verbal abuser, right? And this whole, there's never been any evidence that he's abused his wife. Okay. Um, how many women have you met? Because I've met quite a few and I've been one um, who were abused and nobody knew. Yeah. It's nobody knew, right? The shame, the shame sits with the woman, not, Absolutely. not the perpetrator. Absolutely. And when you're out in public, you wear the smile. Yeah. Everything's wonderful. Everything's fantastic. So I had no doubt that he was a control freak and that when she stood up to him, boom, he snapped. He snapped. So, well, the real hero in this story is um, his stepfather-in-law. Uh, oh, sure. Case of, he was relentless. Sure. And, he, and he even, before he died, recorded, made a recording that he wanted played every time in the instance that Jeffrey came up for parole. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just reiterated and emphasized the fact that he wanted his former son-in-law to, to, uh, finish out his sentence, right. right. To basically die in prison. So. Right. And, you know, they also say that sociopaths and psychopaths, they also usually thrive in prison. Really? Here he is. Yeah. Yeah. So you look at, um, who was the Ponzi scheme guy? Um, Bernie Madoff. Yeah. Um, how he's doing really well in prison and yet, you know, both of his sons, um, have expired. Um, and he's doing great. So, um, so it's no wonder that he's 79 and still, still kicking in prison. So I hope at least, you know, it's, it's a little miserable for him. Asshole. Yeah. Really just very tragic, tragic case. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. But thank you. Since this was, you did a fantastic job on this one, really. And it, I know it took you forever and I know you have so much, so much going on. It's okay. Um, so this was well done. Applause. Thank Applause you. all around. Thank you. Um, just, I wanted to revisit a, a comment that someone posted on YouTube about um, last week's case. Okay. Another men behaving badly case. Um, Catherine yeah. posted a comment about how uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, who we had profiled in a case around the Kennedy yep. uh, sequence, yep. how she was so instrumental in helping F. Lee Bailey defend um, contributed to the defense of Sam Shepard when F. Lee Bailey took on the case and, and helped him out. And it's not that I chose to not acknowledge Dorothy's contributions. It's more that I really wanted to focus on the efforts mm -hmm. surrounding um, Sam, his story, and we'd already kind of covered Dorothy. So I didn't want yeah. to kind of marry the two. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's yeah. why I did well, it the watching, way I did they're, it. They're watching uh, intently, which I love, right? Like they're like, giving us feedback, which is fantastic. So um, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, Sandy. And thank who who is the woman? Catherine. Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it. So I love when um, they get invested. Yeah. So next week we'll continue our theme of men behaving badly. And uh because there uh, just aren't enough of them. There aren't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do three more cases on men behaving badly badly. So next week is a, another installment on men behaving badly. Yay. Hopefully it's not gonna be as long as this one. No. 
I hope not. I haven't written it yet, but I hope not. Yeah. The one after that, really long. Sorry. Oh, God. Well, let me know if you want any help and I'll just pretend to. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Here's a link. You can research exactly. it here. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, really well done, Sammy. Really well done. I just, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. You just, you bring it every single week. I get the easy part. You really do. The homework and the hard part I think part we should switch places and let me tune in. We like... tried that. It didn't work. It did not work. <laughs> <laughs> We'd already tried that. That's why we missed like two weeks worth of podcasts because I was like, yeah, it's still coming. Yeah, I, I like writing fiction. I don't, um, I'm not a, I'm not a, a nonfiction kind of writer. I'm like, it's like, I kept finding myself even when I wrote, wrote that one up, like wanting to like fill it in with, you yeah. know, stuff. So it's just, it's not my forte, but it's so interesting though, that because like you are a very factual, um, linear thinker. Um, so, uh, your forte really shines through on these really. So. Really, I, I'm not quitting. Please I'll keep doing more. it. Yeah. Please, please. Here's a compliment. <laughs> oh, okay. worth it. So anyway, <sighs> um, thank you everyone for tuning in. <laughs> Here I am going on and on about what a wonderful person you are. And you're like, shut up. Yeah, right. <laughs> Delete. <laughs> and scene, click. <laughs> yeah. All right, baby. I love you. Love and you. Um, I will talk to you very soon. Sounds okay. And we'll see all you guys back here. If you enjoyed the podcast, please hit the like button. We love it. If you feel like you want to comment, please do. Um, we read them all between Sandy and I, we read them all. Um, sometimes I'm a little late, but we do read them all. Um, and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And if you would like to schedule a reading with yours truly, um, please head to victorialory.com and um, you can learn more about my books, more about, um, scheduling an appointment. Oh, and I am doing a class. I'm doing another class, mediumship and intuition development. You don't have to have any ability to just show up and I will show you how to do it all. Um, and that starts the first Wednesday in October. So sign up. Anyway. All right. I love you, honey. And I will love see, you too. You, see you soon. Okay. Well, all right. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.